please raise your hand and we will work. Everybody's invited to, everybody's welcome to, to be a part of the Q&A. We will get to as many questions as we can. Um, raise your hand. Our staff will work their way over to you with one of these wireless handheld microphones. Um, we invite you to uh, stand as you're able to ask your question and keep your question brief and to the point so we can get to as many questions as possible. That also means that we don't do follow-up, so make sure you, 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 you nail it. Well, it, but I don't mean to raise the bar. Just like ask your question, right? That's fine. And then our team will hold on to the microphone. You don't have to worry about it because we're recording for our live stream and a potential radio broadcast and a potential television broadcast as well. So we want to make sure to place the microphone appropriately. If you don't want to stand up and ask a question, but you do have a burning question that, uh, that you think ought to be asked, tweet it at the City Club and our team will work it into the program. Um, and a couple of other things. Make sure your phones are silent, please, so that we can... Um, so that we don't interrupt the, the program, but do keep them handy. You can tweet through the program, Instagram. If you're a Snapchat person, you can do that too, I guess. TikTok, nobody's TikTok to City Club thing yet, as far as I know. So if anybody wants to be the first, that would be sweet. Um, all right, and then finally, uh, finally, just a note, what we do here is made possible by members and sponsors and, uh, and our generous friends at the Cleveland Foundation as well, as well as many other philanthropic partners throughout Cleveland and Ohio. We thank you for your partnership. We thank you for your membership contributions. If you'd like to know more about membership, um, which is another, we believe, another patriotic act, um, then uh, please see Noel afterwards or, um, or my good friend Alyssa, who I don't think is in the room right now, but she'd be behind the, behind the desk. And, um, and if you become a member today, your next forum is on us. So you're immediately getting a little value back there. But the real value, of course, is participating in democracy. Thank you very much. We're going to get started in five minutes. If there is anybody at your table or nearby that you haven't yet introduced yourself to, you should take care of that. Thank you so much.
Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Robert Conrad, Cleveland State University, the Chautauqua Institution, the Cleveland Clinic, and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated. Good afternoon. Great to see you all here and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. I'm Ron Richard, President and CEO of the Cleveland Foundation and a very proud City Club member. And it's my great honor to introduce today's speaker, the President of the German Marshall Fund of the United States, Dr. Karen Donfried. At the Cleveland Foundation, we envision Greater Cleveland as a place of opportunity led by innovative minds with diverse perspectives. We believe we know our community is made stronger by our connections with other peoples around the world. And that's why over the past 18 years, we've partnered with the German Marshall Fund through support of its flagship leadership development program, the Marshall Memorial Fellowship. Created in 1982 to introduce a new generation of European leaders to the United States, the program expanded in 1999 and began sending emerging leaders from the United States to Europe as well. Today, the Marshall Memorial Fellowship Network consists of more than 2,500 fellows, with Cleveland having one of the largest and most active networks. At its core, the Marshall Memorial Fellowship is about fostering transnational learning and understanding across all sectors in business, government, and civil society. Both the American and European fellows of today are facing a world that's considerably different than when the program was established more than 30 years ago. I think it's considerably different from three years ago. As political and economic climates change around the globe, it affirms just how vital programs like the Marshall Memorial Fellowship are to uphold our shared values and our pillars of democracy. The German Marshall Fund was established as a gift from the people of Germany as a permanent memorial to the post-World War II assistance provided through the Marshall Fund, the Marshall Plan. The Marshall Plan itself, did you know, was an idea hatched in part here in Cleveland. In January 1947, the Cleveland Council on World Affairs held a three-day institute at Public Hall exploring the U.S.'s evolving role in the post-war world. Then Secretary of State James Burns and U.S. Senator Arthur Vandenberg pledged support, and that support became the Marshall Plan. And so it is fitting that we have Dr. Donfried with us today. Through her illustrious career, she has worked to strengthen democracies and the relationships that undergird democratic institutions. As president of the German Marshall Fund of the United States, Dr. Donfried leads an organization dedicated to developing stronger transatlantic relationships in the spirit of the Marshall Plan, championing human rights, free markets, democracy, and the rule of law. She previously served as the special assistant to the president and senior director for European affairs on the National Security Council at the White House and as the National Intelligence Officer for Europe on the National Intelligence Council, the Intelligence Community's Center for Strategic Thinking. Dr. Donfried holds both a master's in law and diplomacy and a PhD from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University, which we won't hold against her, as well as a magister from the University of Munich, Germany. That was one of those inside diplomacy school rivalry jokes that no one really will get, but. <clears throat> <laughs> she received the cross of the Order of Merit from the German government in 2011, became an officer of the Order of Merit of the Italian Republic in 2018, and an officer of the Order of the Crown of Belgium in 2010. 
She received a Superior Honor Award from the U.S. Department of State in 2005 for her contribution to revitalizing the Transatlantic Partnership. Really, she is such an exemplary public servant and in a, in a day and an age where people are, are doubting the importance of government workers, and uh, she is a perfect example of how our democracy benefits from individuals like her. Esteemed guests, members, and friends of the City Club of Cleveland, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Karen Donfrey. Cleveland. <laughs> it's really great to be here, and it's a particular delight to be at the City Club. Thank you, Ron, for that generous and lovely introduction, except for the International Relations School rivalry. Um, you know, I was so touched um, to receive the City Council proclamation, and really, GMF shares that with the Cleveland Foundation because the Cleveland Foundation has been an indispensable partner for us in bringing more folks from Cleveland into this fellowship program. So it was particularly meaningful to have Ron give the introduction. Now, I also want to give a thank you to Dan, who is one of our illustrious fellows, for inviting me to speak at the City Club. And also, Councilman Griffin, it's wonderful to have... GMF represented in force on the Cleveland City Council. As you saw, there are a lot of Marshall Memorial fellow alumni in the room, and Dan stole my lines because I wanted to have them stand up, and I was going to have our European fellows stand up. But that's already been done. But you can see the power of this network that Ron referred to in this room. So it's so wonderful to see so many folks who've been a part of this program here in Cleveland. Now, I did go a little bit far in the alliteration in my title. <laughs> I, will, I will admit that. I had a little bit too much fun with that. But essentially what I want to talk about today is the U.S. relationship to Europe. And that relationship, without question, has been marked by turbulence since President Trump came into office. And the fact of the matter is that there are a lot of things not just our relationship with Europe, perhaps, that we've taken for granted for decades. And many of those things are being challenged. And certainly, the value of having close allies in Europe is one of those things that I had taken for granted that just seemed fundamental. And it's made me feel that the mission of my organization is more important than it's ever been. GMF's mission, simply stated, is strengthening transatlantic relations in the spirit of the Marshall Plan. What do we mean by that? GMF is not a partisan organization. And I am an American who does believe in public service, and I've served in administrations of both parties. I was at the State Department under President Bush. I was at the National Intelligence Council in the White House under President Obama. And transatlantic relations have never been a partisan issue in this country. It didn't matter if you were a Republican or a Democrat. You tended to believe that it was in the interest of the U.S. to have a strong relationship with Europe. So that's one piece that feels different today. But the other thing is the second part of our mission, that we work in the spirit of the Marshall Plan. And in that sense, GMF has always been an advocate for values. And what we mean when we talk about the Marshall Plan is the values that have undergirded U.S. development since the end of World War II or since the founding of the Republic, a belief that we are well served by a system of liberal democracy, which isn't ruled by the majority. It's rule that also protects the rights of minorities. It's believing in rule of law. It's believing in freedom of the press, an open economy, rights of the individuals, all of these values that undergird that relationship. And I think it's fantastic that the City Club has this 
tagline of helping democracy thrive. Because, of course, freedom of speech is one of those values that does help democracy thrive. And when I think about the Marshall Plan, in my mind, it's the quintessential example of enlightened self-interest. So World War II is over. These countries and economies of Europe are devastated. Americans didn't really want to help rebuild those economies. We'd fought a long, bitter war. We'd spilt a lot of blood. We'd lost a lot of treasure. And Americans were ready to focus on their own country. So when Secretary of State George Marshall said, I've got a great idea. <laughs> Let's spend lots of money to help rebuild Europe. It was not greeted, actually, with enthusiasm. And Republicans in Congress had to be convinced about this. And actually, Arthur Vandenberg, who was the chairman, Republican chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, is a great example of someone who became passionate about this idea and helped by traveling across the country to sell the idea, including to Cleveland, as we just heard. So you see the US, certainly for reasons of benevolence, I do think Americans thought, well, yes, we should help but also for reasons of self-interest, that the US saw these countries in Europe as future markets for our exports, that as we saw the Soviet Union developing its power at the end of World War II and saw communism spreading across Europe, there was also a national security and foreign policy imperative for this as well. But it was a mix of all of those things that led this country to support the Marshall Plan. So GMF today in its work fulfills that mission through our leadership development programs, of which the Marshall Memorial Fellowship is the crown jewel. And just a special shout out to Joe and Carrie and Jason, who have been such engines of that alumni community here in Cleveland. We also do it through our policy work that is sustained by eight offices. The headquarters are in Washington, but we have seven offices across Europe, so half of our staff is European. But that's the work that animates me every day. So all of you don't work on Europe every day, and you may be asking, why do transatlantic relations matter? Why is the Europe important to the United States today? I would make the case that the foreign and security policy rationale is still compelling for the US. NATO is our most important military alliance, whether that is NATO serving on Europe's eastern border, whether it's NATO serving in Afghanistan, or training Iraq's military. After Russia illegally annexed Crimea, a part of Ukraine's sovereign territory in 2014, the United States put sanctions on Russia in coordination with our European allies. And that has led to a much greater economic impact on Russia for that action. And it was the United States and its European allies standing up together saying, it's not OK in the 21st century for a stronger country to simply seize illegally the sovereign territory of its weaker neighbor. And we need to stand up for what's right. So those are some of the foreign and security policy reasons why I believe we are stronger together. There are also powerful economic interests at play here. The United States and the European Union share the largest trade and investment relationship in the world. It's much larger than the US-China relationship or any other relationship that might come to mind. The US and the European Union account for about half of global GDP. The transatlantic economic relationship creates and sustains close to 15 million jobs in the US and in Europe. Let's just take Ohio as one example. Ohio is number 11 in the ranking of the top 20 states by jobs supported directly by European investment. 
So just under 160,000 jobs in this state rely on that investment. 45 out of 50 states exported more to Europe than to China in 2017. Ohio was one of the five states that exported more than twice as many goods to Europe as to China. So for Ohio, you had $8.7 billion of exports to Europe in 2017. You only had $3.8 billion to China. So for this state, this relationship is very powerful. You're exporting transportation equipment and chemical manufacturers and machinery manufacturers. So there are foreign security and economic policy reasons why we all should care about the health of this relationship. So I would argue those fundamentals are still powerful in 2019. That said, we have to acknowledge that both sides of the Atlantic are experiencing significant change. My argument is not one for the status quo in stasis, but it's one that says let's accept the importance of this relationship and then focus on how we continue to make it relevant for today's world. So what are the kinds of changes that I see on both sides of the Atlantic? I see them as both being cyclical in nature and structural in nature. What do I mean by that? Let's start with cyclical change. Arguably, the most important cyclical change in the transatlantic relationship comes every four years with the election of a new U.S. president or the re-election of a U.S. president because the U.S. is the lead nation in this relationship. We're the big kid on the block. And who is governing the U.S. has an outsized impact on our European allies. So that cyclical change, which saw the election of Donald Trump here in 2016, he has brought a singular view, both of U.S. foreign policy and of our relationship to Europe, to the White House. So President Trump's America First policy has, as he's articulated it, is that the United States will no longer allow its national security to be undermined by what President Trump sees as bad deals. So he's been reassessing our alliances, reassessing our trade agreements, and when he believes there's a need, renegotiating or scrapping those agreements to make sure that American interests are defended. Now, you could argue any U.S. president is going to put American interests at the top of the agenda. That's what he is elected to do, and maybe one day she will be elected to do. But that list of priorities and how we define our interests seems to have changed over the past two and a half years. And for our allies, when they look at how we're engaging with them, they will say to me, Karen, you know, we always thought alliance was something enduring, that we agreed on the North Atlantic Treaty and agreed in collective defense. And it feels like today the relationship has become very transactional. There's not an enduring commitment where over time both sides feel they benefit from that, but that it's a day-to-day -day calculation of a transaction. And if every day the U.S. is not ahead in that transactional tally, then there are very important challenges put before the door of our European allies. So the U.S. in reclaiming, in Donald Trump's view, our sovereignty sees this as a zero-sum game. And the hostility that's been there toward the European Union is reflective of a deeper questioning of the multilateral approach that the U.S. has pursued over the past 70 years. So this, this core belief now that's driving U.S. policy, that the United States has gotten a raw deal from its allies, is certainly deeply held by President Trump. And we see that in his comments and in his tweets about the enormous bill that Europe owes the United States for its defense. We also hear about it in terms of the criticism of Germany's massive trade surplus. 
And I want to dig a little bit more deeply into those two issues. On the defense side, President Trump is deeply unhappy that all of our NATO allies are not spending 2% of their GDP on defense. That is a fair criticism. All of our NATO allies agreed to a guideline that by 2024, they would increase their spending on defense to 2% of their GDP. All of them have not made plans to date to reach that goal by 2024. But even for those that have, I think President Trump is deeply frustrated that progress is not being made more quickly. We've seen various disharmonious encounters in the NATO alliance. There was a summit last July where reportedly President Trump threatened to pull the US out of NATO because our allies were not moving quickly enough to reach that goal of defense spending. And even if it is fair to ask our allies to do more, I worry that the approach we're taking is undermining alliance cohesion. And I think the negative impact of that is something we should reflect seriously on. NATO defense spending has been on an upward trend since Putin's invasion of Crimea in 2014. And the reason for that is because I think all of us in NATO realized that we had underestimated the threat posed by what is clearly an aggressive Russia. Two-thirds of NATO allies have plans to reach that 2% of GDP guideline by 2024. I also should point out that our NATO allies spend a lot of money on defense. So in 2017, if you look at the defense spending of NATO allies, if you take the US out, so that would be Europe plus Canada, the total was almost $300 billion. Russia's defense budget totals $166 billion. So while how much we spend on defense is important, it is not the only metric. And we need to also be helping our allies think about how they're spending those defense dollars or defense euros and whether they're spending them effectively enough. And so I think we should be looking at several metrics when we work with our allies in trying together to build the most robust defense that we can. On the trade front, President Trump has felt a deep sense of grievance about the European Union. There are many comments he's made about the EU, and they tend to, I can give you some examples. He feels the European Union was set up to take advantage of the United States, to attack our piggy bank. The EU possibly is as bad as China, just smaller. It's terrible what they do to us. There are very few Americans who are going to stand up and defend the European Union. It's complicated. It's bureaucratic. But it is something this country very much has supported. And it goes back to George Marshall. It goes back to the days after World War II. The US came out of World War II thinking, hmm, these world wars, not such a good idea. We Americans would really like to not go to war in Europe again. So let's figure out how to help Europeans live together in peace. And the European Union is that instrument of peaceful coexistence. And the level of integration that we see in Europe today is something we should take pride in as Americans. We were present at the creation of that. The Marshall Plan didn't actually tell Europeans what to do. It said, you tell us what you need. We also told the European participants in the Marshall Plan to decide among themselves how to divvy up that money. That was brilliant. It was already trying to inculcate patterns of cooperation that have now become deeply ingrained in this European project. And so it just is striking to me that we would now be beating up this organization that we saw is very much in our own interest. And the Trump administration has imposed tariffs on steel and aluminum against our European allies, invoking a national security exemption. 
So in other words, we felt those imports posed a threat to U.S. national security, and on that basis, we put tariffs in place. This was, in many ways, a wake-up call for our European allies. You said, wait a minute, we thought we were your most important partners in NATO, and now you're using a national security exemption to put tariffs on us. So the Europeans have now put retaliatory tariffs on us. The EU is uh, suing the U.S. over tariffs on steel precisely because of that Section 232, that national security exemption that we used, saying that that was illegal. So it's really striking how fraught this relationship with Europe has become over the past years. Now, you could step back and say, but Karen, is this really anything new? I mean, if we think about the past 70 years, we've had lots of examples when Americans and Europeans have not, dis when, when they've disagreed about policy. Take the Iraq War. That's certainly an example where much of Europe did not support that US decision. But I think that what Europeans are seeing today, or what Europeans are asking, is whether this goes deeper than policy differences. They're asking if we Americans are seeing a different role for the US in the world. And this brings me to then the second argument, which is about structural change. That as we can point to this cyclical change, there are deeper fundamental questions about the world order in which we live. And as I was writing this, I was thinking, I'm going to be down the street from the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And I started thinking about Bob Dylan. And his famous lyrics, the times they are a change in, the order is rapidly fading. Is the order rapidly fading? Do we want the order to rapidly fade? And this is where you know, Donald Trump is not a cause of any of these things. He's a symptom of deeper trends in our society. And what strikes me is those trends are there in every European society. We have large swaths of our citizens who feel ill-served by government, who feel that economic inequality, they haven't felt an economic inequality is growing Facts show economic inequality is increased, and Americans worry that their children won't do as well as they did. You see concern about cultural identity being frittered away by migration. All of those trends are there in Europe as well. Those we have to address domestically. We Americans have to decide what kind of society we want to live in, as do Germans or French or Austrians or Ukrainians. But there are other global power shifts that I want to talk briefly about. And I'm just going to name three. The rise of China. Not a new thing. It's been going on for decades. But what had been a quiet rise of China has gotten much noisier under Xi. We see it in the South and East China Seas. We see it on the trade front. We see it in Hong Kong. And Europe sees it because China is now also going west into Europe and buying up strategic infrastructure, among other things. Second, relative decline of the US. I say expressly relative because as China is rising in power, that is influencing the US role in the world. This is, again, not a new development. But what's new is the US had been a status quo power. This international order that we live under is an order we built together with our allies. And the US is now questioning whether that order is serving our interests. So we've taken on many of these multilateral institutions that we created to help build a rules-based foundation for that order. And then thirdly, Europe's division. There are serious forces pulling Europe apart today. There is the aggressive Russia we talked about. There is a very ununified response to refugees and migration that is pulling Europe apart. There is Brexit, the second largest economy in the EU, the United Kingdom, deciding on balance it would rather be out. The rise of authoritarian populism, the future of the Eurozone. 
And you see European countries reacting differently to all of those trends and also reacting differently to President Trump. The polls are embracing President Trump because they're worried about the Russian threat and they're worried about whether their European allies will defend them. All the way to France, which is preaching strategic autonomy, that they can't rely on us anymore and they need to double down on their own capacities to act independently. So what do we do with all this? Given these global challenges that we're facing, can we rebuild an effective transatlantic relationship to try to help manage these. And let's just take one example, which is China. That, I think, is a major challenge this country is facing. Can transatlantic unity be created? Here, I think, in the US, we've seen the growth of a bipartisan consensus that the US has not been tough enough on China. China, for example, in the context of the World Trade Organization, made some commitments that it hasn't lived up to. And we should hold China's feet to the fire to live up to those commitments. There may be different policy approaches to how to do that, but I think there's a broad consensus that we need to do that. U.S. patience that China will reform on its own or that economic liberalization will lead to political liberalization, that patience has ended. Europe is developing a more strategic view of China, and this is relatively new. And part of it has to do with China going west through its Belt and Road Initiative, that Europeans are seeing the Chinese buy up ports and bridges across the continent, and they're worried about the implications of that for European well-being. So we're seeing Europeans look at how we screen foreign investment and want to put in place similar policies. We've seen Europe say, gosh, we agree with you Americans that forced technology transfer is bad and that we need to better protect our intellectual property with regard to China. So it seems that there is an opportunity for us to work together there. And I think we would have greater impact if we were coordinating with our allies, both in Europe and in Asia, on this process. But a problem is that trust has been eroded. We may share interests, we may share values, but Europeans worry that the U.S. will cooperate with China and work out a deal to the detriment of Europe, or that U.S.-China trade tensions will increase in a way that will harm European interests. They'll be stuck in the middle of this U.S.-China clash. So if we need to rebuild trust, in my mind, that is both a top-down, so you could think about policies we might work on together, and a bottom-up process. And this is where Cleveland is part of that process. Cleveland is already playing an important role in this because of the economic relationship, but also because of societal relations. I mean, whether it's the city club hosting folks who bring that global perspective, whether it's Global Cleveland, and I love how Joe articulates the mission of Global Cleveland, on a mission to make Cleveland the most welcoming city in America, whether it's GMF's fellows in Cleveland who are bringing a sensibility from their travels here and seeing the connections and seeing how the transatlantic relationship can make a difference at city level, or whether it's the Cleveland Foundation, which is the country's oldest community foundation and has always seen Cleveland through the prism of a global role as well. And you know, when I think about the work that's happening at the city level and how that contributes to a transatlantic community that ranges from how can we build a diverse and inclusive workforce to sharing best practices for veterans' care. Those are examples of projects our alumni are working on in their own cities, whether it's Ohioans who work for European companies or who work for American companies that are exporting to Europe. All of those are part of the ties that connect societies and build trust. So in this, each of us has agency. 
Yes, our world is turbulent. Yes, it may be appealing to turn inward and let's focus on ourselves. But by turning inward, it doesn't protect us. It doesn't avoid the impact of turbulence beyond our borders on our own country and on our own cities. So I really think the time for all of us to engage is now. And that can be through the City Club, through Global Cleveland, through the Cleveland Foundation, in any way that you all interact in this city. But the bottom line is we shouldn't take things for granted that we care about, whether that's the values by which we live, whether those are the relationships we have beyond our borders. And I just want to caution about taking the relationship with Europe for granted. Because I do think facts are stubborn things, and we've benefited a lot from that relationships. So I think friends are powerful assets in a turbulent world, whether they are here in Cleveland or across the Atlantic in Europe. And that is what I wanted to share with you. Thank you. I'm Dan Malthrop, Chief Executive here at the City Club. Today we're enjoying a forum with Dr. Karen Donfried, President of the German Marshall Fund of the United States. We're about to begin the audience Q&A and we welcome questions from everyone, City Club members, guests, students, and those of you joining us via our live stream. If you'd like to tweet a question, you can tweet it at the City Club and our team will work it into the program. Holding our microphones today are Office and Customer Experience Coordinator, Tiffany France, and Director of Programming, Stephanie Jansky. May we have our first question, please? Hi, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, you mentioned that, can I hold this myself? <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned uh, the change of order in this current political environment, and um, there is this underlying belief among American population, which is when Trump is gone, somehow the transatlantic relationship can be restored to some extent. But there is another small but emerging group of historians who have a different opinion. Some of them, like Paul Morland, the demographic historian, he argues that with the further integration of ethnicities, it is extremely, or at least getting harder and harder for democracies to hold people apart, and fragmentization politically is inevitable. And there are also techno -histo historians who think that in the age of data and information and technology, the job of the job of governing is even harder for a democratic institution, and it's easier for an authoritarian institution to do the job. Do you believe that's the case here? And if, um, when Trump is gone, uh, that um, restoration is not, oh my God, I'm not. <laughs> so I guess my question is, um, the transatlantic uh, relationship is, is more beyond just the military or economic. There's also the idea of the, the, being the champion of liberalism and democracy in this world. But the harm that is coming for us is simply not just about Trump, but more about the changing tide. Mm -hmm. The further integration of ethnicities and the changing of technology are not things that can change and are inevitable. And do you think that's a threat? And how do we um, tackle these challenges? No, that's a great question. I was told I can wander around, because I might, so I'm going to wander. Um, you know, this is a really important question, and it gets back to what the US role in the world is and what do we want it to be. And you're right, there's a vibrant debate about this. And I don't know if anyone in the room has read a book called The Jungle Grows Back. It's written by a guy by the name of Robert Kagan, who's in Washington at a think tank, Brookings. He's written a lot about US foreign policy. And what he means with that title, The Jungle Grows Back, is we live in a Hobbesian world, that people by their nature are not necessarily good. And if we look at the sweep of world history, it's marked by great power war. The longest period of time we've gone without a great power war is the past 70 years. And he argues the reason for that is the role of the United States. That the United States is the lead nation in the de democratic world was willing to use its hard power and its soft power to keep the vines of that jungle back. Now he argues the US stopped doing that before Donald Trump. He's very critical of Barack Obama for not having enforced the red line in Syria. And he thinks this will probably extend beyond Donald Trump unless Americans decide they don't want that to. 
Um, and it's an interesting question about the role of the US in the world. He doesn't see any other country or set of countries willing to play that role. So it's really ringing an alarm bell in a way. Um, I think, you know, having also served in the Obama administration, I don't think Barack Obama was trying to isolate the US from the world. I think he felt that we had overextended US power in places like Afghanistan and Iraq. We set goals for ourselves that we needed to admit we had not reached. And so how do you right size US power in the world? And in that construct, allies become very important because if there's a relative decline of US power, you can aggrandize that power if you're working with other countries that share your interests and values. So on China, Trans-Pacific Partnership, Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, you're trying to extend a rules-based trading order to then put pressure on China to accede to it. Now, Barack Obama failed in that. He didn't get either one of those things passed. But, you know, I think there's first a question about what role do we Americans want to see our country playing in the world? Do we support that role? And there's just a recent Chicago Council poll that's really interesting that suggests there's tremendous support still among the American public for playing that kind of a global role. And then you get to your questions, which is, well, how do you manage the technology challenge? That arguably is one of the largest challenges ahead of us. My view is you want to manage that together with other democracies, because it's how do you use and manage technology as a democracy. We can see how China is using technology for social credits in China, or how it's using it in Xinjiang with the Uyghurs. OK, that's not how we Americans want to use technology. But if we want to set the rules for that, if we want to regulate that in a global world, I think we would want to do it with our European allies, with our Asian allies, who share that value space. So I think the answer, yes, we face new big challenges, but I still think we're going to be better served by engaging globally and engaging globally with those who share those interests and values. So that would be my answer. Thanks. At the presidential debate, there was discussion about the fact that we have either automation or globalization that's impacting the American worker. What is your take on that conversation and how it impacts um, trade policy, especially with our European friends? So I missed most of the presidential debate because <laughs> I was at a dinner and I, caught, I did catch some of it. Um, and it was great that it was in Ohio. You guys all had a front row seat on it. Um, so. I think what's so important about the conversation about automate, automation is how do Americans who feel that they've been the losers of globalization, and Ohio has seen a lot of manufacturing jobs leave this state and go to China. So is that, is, what's the conclusion you draw from that? Is the conclusion you draw from that that we don't want to have free trade agreements, that we want protectionism, that we need to protect our industry? I don't think that's the right conclusion. I actually think we want to extend a rules-based trading order and hold those who sign up to the agreements to the terms of those agreements. A, and B, we have to recognize that a lot of those jobs are also being lost because of automation. And that has to spark a serious conversation in the United States about the future of work, because that trend is continuing. And you know, if we have electric vehicles, automated vehicles, what happens to truck drivers? I mean, you can think about industries that will be deeply affected by automation. Now, you know, technological revolutions generally have been good for us. We live longer. We, there are all kinds of wonderful things that flow from technology. But I think all of us today need to be thinking about the future of work and what does that mean when many jobs, there will be an automation answer. It's not tomorrow, but that's why we need to start thinking about it today. And again, in my mind, this is the kind of thing you want to be thinking about with other countries that have economies similar to ours. 
turns out a lot of Europeans have really interesting ideas about how you manage the future of work. A lot of Japanese, too, with an aging society, have thought a lot about this. So, you know, I think these are real problems, and we just have to be careful that we don't point to simple causes or simple solutions, but really wrestle with what the implications of them are, and then work collectively to find an answer to that. But I think it's a critically important issue, because all of, for all of us, the work that we do provides us you know, it provides us a sense of value and contribution. And so when we think about how, if that changes, how do we contribute to society in a different way? So I think it's a key issue. Thanks, thanks for raising it. Dr. Donfried, uh, thank you so much for a great presentation um, and for your support of the transatlantic uh, relationship. Uh, quick question, you started going down the path of coming up with commonalities between the European Union and the US in terms of China. Um, maybe you could touch on the fact the U.S. now is a net exporter of energy. Um, what's your view on the whole Nord Stream situation, yeah. how we can potentially uh, deal with that? Yeah. So for those of you who don't know what Nord Stream 2 is, <laughs> this is a pipeline that will flow from Russia to Germany. And it's been very contentious. Within Europe, I'm sure some of our European fellows who are here uh, can speak at length to this. Um, it's been contentious within Europe, and it's been contig contentious in the transatlantic relationship. So the U.S. view and the view of many European countries is that this is not a moment when we want to be increasing European dependence on Russian energy sources. Uh, the alternate view, and this is a view expressed by Germany, is, look, we have been dependent on energy supplies from Russia for the entire sweep of history since the end of World War II. And this is a reality. And Russia doesn't want to impinge those supplies because they like the Western currency. And where else are we going to get this energy from? Now, the US answer is, we've got LNG. And the US is now an exporter of energy. So let's build more LNG terminals in Europe. And then you don't need to rely on Russia. You can rely on liquefied natural gas. Now, the one issue with that has been, we don't live in a command economy in this country. And Asia has been willing to pay higher prices for that LNG, so much of that LNG has been flowing to Asia. Now, you have seen LNG terminals built in several European countries, and that flow, I think, will continue. But the thing that's been made this debate over Nord Stream 2 even more politically sensitive is Nord Stream 2, it used to be that that Russian gas and oil would flow through Ukraine. And Nord Stream 2 bypasses Ukraine. So at the moment, the part of Ukraine's territory has been annexed by Russia, and they're still fighting in Ukraine's east. Ukraine will no longer get the transit fees when, from when that pipeline went through Ukraine. So there was an added level of political sensitivity on this. The pipeline essentially is built, has been built today. So there's a question about whether the US Congress is going to put sanctions on the German companies involved and other companies involved in building that pipeline. I don't know how that's going to play out. But it has been a very sensitive issue, one of several in the US relationship with Germany in particular. Um, the larger frame of energy and energy independence is a very important one in the transatlantic conversation. Um, it also relates to the U.S. posture in the Middle East. Uh, I, I won't go down that road, but it certainly has played a larger role in the transatlantic relationship since the U.S. has, has become so energy rich. I'll stop with that, yeah. Hello, I'd like to ask a question about populism. How does the you explain to the deep state slash power elite in both Washington, D.C. and Brussels the effect of the populist movement over the last 40 years. 40 years ago, Maggie begat Ronnie, and four years ago, Brexit begot Donald, begot Boris. When will the power elite understand that middle America, middle England, is mad at them? Well, <laughs> You know, it's so, so you don't think Boris Johnson is part of the power elite? I mean, but 
Yeah, so clearly Brexit should, well, maybe I was going to say was a wake-up call. Maybe it should have been a wake-up call because I think that most people thought, oh, at the end of the day, a majority of Brits will vote to stay in the European Union. And as we know, that wasn't the outcome. 52 to 48 percent voted that the UK should leave the EU. Um, that was actually, it was in June of 2016 that I thought Donald Trump was going to win. Because I thought, okay, there's something happening in our societies. Wide swaths of citizens are very unhappy with how they are being governed. And in the case of the UK, the EU became the scapegoat for that. We can debate about whether that was fair or not, whether the facts that were used in that debate were honest or misrepresentative, but that was the outcome. And it's so interesting today to hear Boris Johnson say, look, we have got to get out of the EU on October 31st, come hell or high water, because we need a clean break. This is what the British people want. Well, you know, it's not at all clear that even those 52% of Brits who voted for Brexit were voting for a no-deal Brexit. I think they were voting for a government that was going to negotiate a smooth exit out of the EU. So let's put that to the side. But to the larger point of we want a clean break with the EU, the UK cannot have a clean break with the EU. Even if there's an agreement, and I hope there is, I think it would be great if Boris Johnson can agree with the other EU leaders on a deal that allows the UK to leave on October 31. It's not going to be a clean break. All that they will have agreed is the terms on which the United Kingdom leaves the European Union. The Euro countries of the European Union are Britain's closest trading partners. So Britain then has to negotiate a new trading deal with the EU. So, you know, geography is destiny. And Britain may be an island, and it may not technically be part of Europe, but it is part of Europe. And it will always have these countries as its closest trading partners. It will continue to have deep political and security ties with the other countries of Europe. So it's, Britain will figure out how to manage that. But it is hard to not see this as something that is damaging to the UK. I just this morning saw a report that the hit on the British economy just for the negotiating period is substantial because of lost investment, because even though the British pound is weaker, it hasn't demonstrably increased British exports elsewhere. So Brits will pay a price for this decision, and that is their choice. If they want to be outside the EU, they should choose that. But I want all of us to have good information for decisions we make. And that's as true for Americans as it is for Brits. So if we decide on balance, the US is better off on its own. Let's put up protectionist barriers. Let's, I just want that to be a reasoned debate where we really think through the costs and benefits of that policy. And to your point, politicians have to listen to citizens for sure. But they also have to explain their policies. And you know, I worry that in this sort of fact-free or false fact world, it becomes harder to do that. And maybe it makes the city club all the more important, where you have debates and people disagree without being disagreeable, but we really wrestle with what those choices are that we want to make. And I'm not sure that happened to the extent that might have been good for Britain in this particular case. Good afternoon. Uh, I really appreciate your commenting on the importance of connections of Cleveland itself with Europe. One important connection is that Cleveland has the only port on the, lake, on the Great Lakes that has a direct scheduled uh, shipping to Europe. It's called the Cleveland European Express. Yes, we are. We're the only uh, port on the Great Lakes that does I that. Know. That's yes, cool. I know. That's A lot of folks don't know that. Um, and it's important because we have a major um, uh, steel manufacturer, ArcelorMittal, right down the Cuyahoga. 
we were all concerned um, when the tariffs were um, placed, especially on steel. And so uh, could you tell me what the current status is of the tariffs uh, and the negotiations and what you see for the future, uh, especially that could affect um, the heartland like Cleveland? Yeah. Well, unfortunately, there are no indicators that the U.S. is going to lift those tariffs anytime soon. Uh, and in fact, there's still sort of a <laughs> Damocles sword of a tariff threat hanging over Europe, which is car tariffs. Because another issue that President Trump has been very sensitive to has been uh, European cars imports into this country. Um, and he has suggested that he might put tariffs on European cars as well, which also would have an impact on Americans because most of the major European car companies, in particular the big three European companies, have major manufacturing sites in this country. Um, so I don't foresee that uh, being settled in the short term. I will say Secretary of State Pompeo made a trip to Brussels last month saying he wanted to reset relations with the European Union, which I very much welcome. And he met with the incoming leadership of the EU. There was some talk about could there be a trade agreement negotiated. I think the challenge for the Europeans is that reset probably can only happen if the steel and aluminum tariffs are dealt with and lifted. So there are some underlying issues that probably do need to be addressed before that reset really can take shape. Today at the City Club, we've been enjoying a forum with Dr. Karen Donfried, tracking her through the room, president of the German Marshall Fund of the United States. Our community partners for today's forum include the Cleveland Council on World Affairs and Global Cleveland. Our hospitality partner is the Metropolitan at the Nine Hotel. We appreciate your partnership. We welcome guests at tables hosted by Cleveland City Council, the Cleveland Foundation, the Cleveland German Marshall Fund alums, the City of Sandusky, Fifth Third Bank, First Energy Foundation, Councilman Kerry McCormick, Margaret W. Wong and Associates, Melanie Shakarian, Mocha Cleveland, and the Cleveland Irish Network. Thank you all so much for joining us today. That brings us to the end of our forum. Thank you so much, Dr. Don Fried, for your words and your leadership. Thank you, members and friends of the City Club of Cleveland, and special thanks to our City Club members whose financial support makes our work possible. You can find out more about City Club forums and how you can support City Club online at cityclub.org. Our forum is adjourned. Have a great day. For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org. Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Robert Conrad, Cleveland State University, the Chautauqua Institution, the Cleveland Clinic, and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated. Could we get all the fellows up toward the stage, please? Any Marshall Memorial fellows, past and present, to the stage. Thank you. <laughs>